All right, so this is the finished product of the gate as we walk up. We made sure to install a keypad on a 4x4 post with some concrete. And here it is. It's pretty easy to program, so we went ahead and put a guest password in there just for the contractors that plan to bring in later. We also opted for the solar panel kit. It does not come with that arm that you see in the picture. Uh, definitely got to order a separate arm or find a way to mount it without the arm. So I'll leave that up to you guys, but it does not come with it. Here you have the two control panels. The battery store is in the right hand, so the larger can. And then we've got the two arms that control the gates as they open and close. We used conduit to run it under the gate to make sure the wire is protected. It comes with two placards that warn of the gate opening and closing. We put those up since we're running a business out of this location and want to make sure we don't have any kind of liability. If people decide to just stand next to the gate while it's opening and closing, even though the boxes do sound an alarm as it does this. All right, guys. So we're here on the property today. We've already set the gates. We talked about that in a previous video. These are 12 foot gates, uh, tube gates, so they're very light, very easy to move. We decided to go with ghost control gate operators. So if you look here, pretty beefy. Uh, they've got good reviews, you know, some mixed reviews, but mostly good reviews. Uh, I would say Mighty Mule is probably their number one competition right now for a uh, residential installation of gate operators. Otherwise, you'd go into LiftMaster uh, if you're talking about commercial, probably. Most people would prefer large iron gates. I don't have money, so these are a good low cost option. It's about $129 per gate in my area. So can't complain about that. We went with the 20 foot spread or 24 foot spread because any type of trailer, dump truck, anything that you want to move in and out of here, campers, boats, it makes it easy. Nobody's going to clip your gate. Uh, nobody's going to complain about there not being enough space. Something else to keep in mind, I know a lot of people like to do the archways over the top. I've got power lines that run really close right here. And then on top of the power lines, we have in the past, on my uncle's property, they do cotton, and there's some of their cotton semis that they pull in and out will bump it, so they ended up having to cut out the archway across the top that had a sign of the farm. So what I'm gonna do instead is once I get these cattle panels done that I'm using my building my fence out of, I'm gonna mount some two by sixes across it, and I'm gonna mount my uh, signs for my business onto the four by four and two by six construction. But anyway, the goal today is to get the Ghost control system installed, the operator's installed. I'm gonna to try to trench through the driveway. I've got a crew coming in in a few weeks once it dries out a little bit more here with all the rain we've been getting. And they're gonna put new gravel down for the entire driveway. So I gotta make sure I get this done before that. Otherwise, I'm gonna cause myself a lot more headache and extra work. Uh, I'm gonna mount the control box on the left side. If you look at the box, it's got a diagram on it to tell you how everything needs to get mounted. Uh, it also comes with instructions for each individual piece and then an overall instruction manual. I bought the wireless keypad and two wireless transmitters. The good thing about the Go system and the reason I went with it is because you can buy as many of the wireless buttons to open the gate as you want and attach it to the system. So that means as my kids get older, I can buy two for them. If I've got friends that come by a lot, I could buy them one and have it sitting here or they could use the keypad. Uh, you can also do a app on your phone. I didn't opt in for that extra piece because it was two or $300 extra. So I'm trying to watch the bank right now to make sure we can get as many projects around here done as possible. All right, so this is where we're gonna put a four, this four by four post that we've already cut. We're gonna set it here. I cut it intentionally shorter than this six by six. And we're just gonna run two of the two by sixes with it and give a place to mount these boxes to. Now my actual fence is gonna come straight out down towards the road and then cut down and follow the road just like we're doing over here, but I'm not gonna cut it at an angle because I don't wanna have to try to cut and dig up this stump yet. I don't really wanna spend the extra money to have somebody come and do it for me either. So we're just gonna square this one off more than likely. Uh, but I don't want the, anybody that walks up to be able to get to the actual control box easily. I mean, I know at the end of the day, anybody can cut through a fence, jump a fence, but we don't wanna leave it easily accessible for their hands to get on it. Uh, these gate openers, uh, I think a lot of people don't really put locks on them, but typically you can put locks on the turnbuckles or the, the turning, the, the oval shaped pieces. And that way they can't just come unhook it and, and you know, sling the gate open. And the goal is like any security system is gonna have breaches, but this makes it more difficult and it makes it more, you know, less likely for somebody to want to walk up and deal with the headache of getting through a gate. Now what we're doing with this four by four hole is we've got all purpose grade gravel. You always wanna put that in the bottom, especially in a property like this in Georgia. Uh, where I come from in Alabama, everything's red clay. You don't really get a lot of standing water and stuff as long as you cover it up. But here you get tons of standing water in the ground. Uh, it's real nice, you know, brown soil, I guess. So uh, you want to put that in the bottom to give the water a place to drain out. And then you want to do concrete because, again, the soil is so soft that it's easy to dig into. Uh, so your post will move over time if you don't make sure you do a decent concrete. So dig out a wide diameter hole around your 4x4. Four four. 
throw it down there, level it out on top of this gravel, leave it, but just put, you know, three, four inches of that gravel in there, maybe six, whatever you feel comfortable with, to bring it up to the height that you want it at, and then pour the concrete around the sides, and just use quick rate, let it dry real quick, and then move on with your day. All right, so another important aspect that I want to talk about and mention is if you have anything running through your house, uh, utility-wise, water, uh, internet connection, cable, whatever the case may be, and it's buried in the ground, be very mindful that they don't always bury them deeply, right? Typically, you would want to bury something 12 to 18 inches in the ground. That way, if anybody comes to grade it, anybody comes to aerate the lawn, it's not going to get hit. I assumed that AT&T would do that. That's who I have for a fiber provider. They did not. <laughs> this wire... So you got, you got uh, dig numbers you can call. I think here it's 811. You call them, they put in a ticket, and anybody in the area that has any utility that runs through your property will come out and mark it. The only thing I have here, because I'm on well water, uh, and power only, and power goes overhead, is AT&T. So they come out, they put these orange flags in, they'll put some spray paint lines on the ground, basically let you know where the utility roughly runs. And I was being very careful because I've got a flag here and a flag there. So basically a foot in from this six by six post, the utility line runs. And I assumed, again, thinking that they did the right thing, the line would be buried deeply. This line is not, I would say, maybe a half an inch to an inch below the topsoil, right? So I called the guy that's gonna be grading and putting in the gravel for my driveway and just make sure that he's aware because this runs straight down the driveway and then cuts across to the house. So, and that's one of the spots where I want him to grade and level. I just wanted to make sure he was aware because some of these guys won't uh, call the dig number. They just expect you to let them know ahead of time, which as a property owner, you're managing the uh, construction site. So it is kind of your uh, gig. So make sure you always call that number because you don't know what's going to be going on. Like I would not have expected AT&T to run this down the driveway and then over to the house. I would have expected them to come from the front of the house uh, in a more straight line. So like I said, be mindful. We're going to finish trenching this out. So we got a way somewhere to put this wire. I bought some electrical conduit, it's just that plastic PVC type that I'm going to try to run. Assuming I have enough wire, I'm kind of concerned that they didn't give me enough uh, wire length to really do what I want to do, which is, you know, put it 12 to 18 inches under the ground. So I'm going to be very careful with how much uh, slack I use up and I'll probably have to mount my box very low. So in order to make the most of the day, you can see that I go ahead and start filling in the concrete around this post. We've already put a couple of inches of gravel in the bottom for the water to drain out. It's going to take it a little while for this to dry, you know, a few minutes to a couple of hours. I always like to let them set up for a few hours before I do anything that's going to put any pressure on them. We already drug the hose over. Got to stick to where we can kind of churn it up a little bit, make sure the water gets all the way through to the bottom because we don't want this post tilting over. We want to try to keep it as level as possible. All right, so now we're ready to do the mounting brackets on the six by six post. These are gonna to attach to our tube gate. If you had a different style of gate, uh, I think the square ones, you can drill through those, but they're gonna send you different mounting brackets and different instructions based on what your setup is. So you wanna have an F clamp ready and a level because you're going to need to basically put it center of the post, maybe have to cheat it one way or the other, depending on your setup. Uh, and then you want it to be as centered on the gate as possible, right? So. Mine's not perfectly centered due to the alignment of the bars, but I went ahead and went with the most center most bar that I could. And that is what will keep the gate balanced and make it easier to open. You may have to make some adjustments on the hinges if your gate's not level. At this part in the process, we have not screwed or attached the bracket yet. We're measuring the distance so that we can, there's set pins, two bolts that you have to put in there. That way it's at the proper distance from the gate itself. Uh, make sure you do this before you screw it into the post. That way if you have to make adjustments at the post side, you can. That's the purpose of the clamp is to make sure you can do both level and centered holes while making sure you get the right distance and spacing that you need with the bracket itself. Here we've got the bolts that shipped with the bracket. As you can see, they're designed for a six by six and they leave you a few pieces that'll stick out, a few threads that you can use. Now they do make drill bits that are long enough to go all the way through this post in one go. I, however, did not have the right sized bit to go through here in one go. 
So I took a smaller size bit that was long enough to go through the entire post, and that's what I used. That way when it came out on the other end, we can use that hole to mark it. And then I would take my other bit, which could do it from both sides, and make the hole large enough for the bolts to go through. So that's one way to get around it. Um, otherwise, you could just try to line it up as well as possible using a speed square or a level. But that's probably going to be a little bit more difficult to do, especially if you're trying to keep the holes for the bracket as tight as possible so there's not as much wiggle room. All right, so here you'll see me take the drill, and I'll drill through the longer drill bit. Like I said, it's a smaller gauge. It's not 7 16 inch diameter, and that'll allow me to center on that hole on the back side when I come in from either end on the shorter bit that is the right size at 7 16 inch. And then we repeated this process on the other side, and as you can see, I test fit some of the bolts just to make sure that I line the holes up well enough to make sure that the uh, diameter is going to go all the way through. And I was trying to make it to where it wouldn't take too much persuasion, but one of the bolts was being a little tight, so I did take a hammer and tap it the rest of the way through, making sure that it wasn't so tight to damage the threads. And as I stated, this is the exact same process you'll take on the other side. Make sure you put your washers in the proper place, use the lock nut as intended, and you won't have any issues with the gate coming loose. So make sure you've got some sockets on hand to come out here and tighten up the nuts and the bolts. A uh, ratcheting wrench would also work, or a drill bit driver if you've got the appropriate sizes. I couldn't find mine today in my toolbox, so we just went ahead and did it by hand with the ratchet. Didn't take too long. I made sure that as I was tightening them, I was kind of going from one corner to the other, instead of going side to side, just so we would have a little bit of offset. And I was making sure to keep it as level as possible. That's one reason why I wanted the mounting bolts to be as tight as they possibly could in the wood. Granted, there is enough space where you can leave them a little bit loose to allow for slight adjustments later. Now that we've got the mounting bracket all nice and tight on the post, we can go ahead and grab the arm. Make sure that the arm with a longer cable is on the far side from where you plan to mount the control panel and the solar panel. That way you make sure you've got enough slack and you don't have to come back and swap everything out later. So we went ahead and slid the arm in. You have a bolt and a couple of washers that you slide through there. There's also a white plastic uh, bushing that you need to slide in between the bracket and the uh, circular mounting hole for the arm. Basically it'll slide on that plastic instead of sliding on the metal. So it should help extend the life and keep it a nice smooth drive motion back and forth. All right, now that enough time has passed that the four by four, four by four post has had time for the concrete around it to dry, we're gonna go ahead and start cutting up the two by six boards to mount. So just take your nice refurbished, very expensive sawhorse. In this case, it's gonna be my golf cart that I just freshly painted. <laughs> And uh, go ahead and measure out what you need for the distance between the 6x6 post and the 4x4 post. Keeping in mind that you're not going edge to edge. You're going center of post to center of post. That way if you need to come back and build another post off of it, you've got somewhere to screw on the boards in the future. It's a good habit to get into so that you're not messing it up down the road. Like and subscribe. Now you'll notice here that I've dropped the board down a few inches below the very top. And that's because I want to put caps on the top or at a minimum cut or route the top so that way water can't sit on there. It's one of the fastest ways for these flat top posts to rot out is just having water sit there all the time. So we take our level, we screw in the board on one side, then we screw it in on the other using our F clamp to kind of, our C clamp to help hold everything to, in place and keep it nice and level. And uh, just like I said, keep in mind you want to have a way to get the water off there. You can cut it at an angle. Um, I typically just take a router, run it around the edge to narrow the top of it just a little bit because all these boards have expanded to some by now. And then I'll take one of those black plastic, black metal caps and put on top. I do plan to put LED lights on the top that are solar powered. That way we have a nice looking entryway when people come in. All right, so now that we've got the two boards mounted to the top, one at the bottom for stability, we want to go ahead and mount the box. Now the box does come with instructions and it tells you that it would prefer you to mount the box about three feet up off the ground, which is why I moved it higher than I initially planned to. That way water is not going to splash up on it. It'll keep the dirt, the grass when you're trimming and cutting off of it. So definitely recommend to follow those instructions. One thing I didn't do that I wish I did is I wish I dropped the box down enough for the antenna not to be blocked by the 6x6 post and by the 2x6 uh, I think that's kind of limited the range that we get, so bear that in mind. The box also has uh, does not have pre-drilled holes, but it does have pre-made markers. So I took a drill bit and pre-drilled my holes because I didn't want to split the plastic or risk breaking it. Uh, after I pre-drilled the holes, I took exterior screws. So even for the wood, make sure you're using exterior rated screws. 
Uh, if you use interior rated screws, they're going to corrode within a matter of weeks or months, depending on the amount of rain you get. And they will just straight up snap off with the first line of pressure that gets applied. So I'm using all exterior rated uh, screws. That way they have that coating on the outside that should help protect and make it last longer in the weather. It also states that in the instructions, it wants you to mount the solar panel within, uh, you know, I think it's, I believe it's 40 feet of the panel. So the closer you can mount the batteries and the closer you can mount the solar panels to the, the control box, the better off you're going to be. They also have pre-made rings on the bottom, on the bottom. So you don't have to worry about drilling out the boxes to get your wires inside. Everything will fit. It's going to be kind of tight. So just unscrew it, slide it on and you'll be good to go. It'll keep it watertight, keep the bugs out, hopefully. There's also lock spots on these, so once you slide the cover on, you can put locks on them. I do plan to do that in the future. One thing to note when you're coming in here to route your wires, uh, if you follow the guidelines, it's the best way to go because the terminals that you're going to be screwing the strip wires into line up directly with the specific slot that the wire needs to go through. Uh, the battery cable comes into the leftmost hole next to the power switch, and you're going to route that up and around the board. And then the other two wires for your gate controllers, assuming you have dual arms like me, will come in through the hole that's directly below their terminal point. One thing I do like about this control system, everything is very clearly marked with the wire color of where you need to land it and what the operation of that terminal is, whether it's for battery, uh, solar panel. You can also do AC. This does come with a uh, AC powered block. I don't have power ran to this fence, so I went with the solar powered system. But you do you cannot do both with the system. Uh, you could probably find a way to do it, but with what I ordered, it was not an option to do both. You do one or the other, but you could probably do a solar powered backup to just keep the batteries charged and it just wouldn't connect directly to your control panel. Now if you watch as I route these cables into the panel, you'll see that I attempt to keep them level, but I do leave a little bit of slack to where if water runs down the cable from condensation or early morning, late night dew or rain, it's got a spot to drip off, right? So typically we call that a drip loop. Um, and it's just to make sure that nothing can run into the box that's water. So as another reminder, if you guys get the solar power panel kit like I did, it does not come with a mounting bracket. You will have to order that separate. Um, I got mine through Unity. It's where I typically order Wi-Fi uh, transmitters and receivers. That way, you know, you can transmit over a long distance. They're typically made to mount on the side of the house. And in this case, I'm just going to mount it to the side of the 4x4. You need to keep in mind when mounting your solar panel of trees or any obstructions that might block it from getting sunlight and you're going to want to position it they stay position it south what i did is try to position mine as much in line with the path that the sun follows on my property right that's the best way to think about it you want as much direct sunlight hitting that panel as possible that way i can power the control panel during the day and help charge your batteries back up All right, guys, so what I've done here is I've gone ahead and I've run some metallic conduit underground. Uh, everything I've read, there are different opinions depending on the area. Some people say six inches, some say 12, some say 18. Uh, this is all roughly six to eight inches in the ground because I'm going to have a couple of truckloads of dirt and gravel come in. And when those come in, this is going to come up another four inches, so it should make us good on our depth. But I wanted to do metallic conduit. I was going to do the plastic PVC. But there's going to be a lot of heavy trucks coming in and out delivering dirt, gravel, all the trailers that I pull in and out for my side work as a woodworker. So I just want to make sure that we're not going to cut the wire, nick the wire, or break it. So right now I've got my fish tape hooked up because we've got that AT&T fiber line right here. So instead of me digging all around it trying to make a nice big hole, <clears throat> I went in and just shoved the metallic conduit up under it through just a little bitty gap of dirt that I left because I don't want to be responsible for if anything were to happen to that fiber. So that conduit is in there with a 90 degree bend. I just wanted to make sure to make it as easy as possible. So it's a steel fish tape. We've already taped up the end of the wire. Uh, when it, whenever you guys are using one of these steel fish tapes too, you're not going for multiple wraps. You're going for coverage of wraps. So do like a third to a uh, half coverage on it as you wind up the steel tape through the wire, just to make sure it doesn't come loose. Short pull like this, not gonna be a big deal. 
Uh, the other thing we did is I went with three quarter inch because I do want to put power out here eventually. The power is going to come from the well house, which is located uh, back to the right. Uh, so if I do that, I don't want to trench through this driveway again if I don't have to. So I wanted to make sure I left enough space in here to where if I needed to use this conduit for that power, I could. But I'll probably just leave the outlet over there and just run a wire to here. That way, if I want to do Christmas lights or anything else, it's an option. Or if we need to put this on main power, we'll be able to do it without having to dig up all the gravel. You'll notice here that I make a mistake. I forget to put the cap over the wire before I pull the wire in through the hole. So I had to pull it back out, unloosen the terminals, and uh, put the cap back on. So don't make that simple mistake. It gets kind of frustrating when you do it three times in a row. <laughs> now we're going to do the final little piece of assembly, and that's to put the bracket directly to the tube gate. Very simple, it's just got two little clamps that slide over and then you slide the bolts and the washers through, screw down the nut, and you're done. I made sure to get mine pretty tight to where it was digging into the metal a little bit because I didn't want it to move in the future and potentially get bound up. There's plenty of space on these gates. They designed it very well uh, on the system. So when the arm's fully retracted like it is in this picture, uh, you know, you want to have the gate in the full open position and the instructions walk you through this very clearly. Uh, at this point, you know, we're getting ready to jog the system forward and back and make sure that everything's working properly. So now we are going to start the jogging process to set the close limit. The open limit is a mechanical set, which is where they're at now. So grab our instructions. So within your control box in the upper right hand corner, you have your switches to set your close limits. Now we are just going to jog these one operator at a time. So turn the panel on, hear the beeps. Looks like we are powered up and ready to go. So we are going to jog the first operator closed. And it says jog closed is the right hand most switch on the top. You just have to push and hold and wait for it to get to the position you want to consider closed. That's pretty close. Let's do the other. We're gonna basically set these at the same time. I want them to be aligned. So we're gonna jog the other one closed. That looks pretty close right there. We might need to bring them both forward just a hair more if we can. And there is a set button in the middle. So once we get them exactly where we want them, we'll press that set button and they will remember the open and close position. So we do need to do it just a hair more. Hard to tell from this angle. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a second pair of hands. All right, let's do the other. All right, let's look down the line, see if it looks pretty straight. That's pretty straight. Right where I want. Okay. Now we'll hit our set buttons. Make sure we don't need to hold them. Press and hold the first set limit button on the control panel until it beeps. And then repeat the process on the second one. There's the beep. And the other beep. Now we can use our transmitter and see if it'll fully open.
That works for me. Now we'll press the button again and see if it goes to the closed position. Now keep mine on the closed, it will do a delay on the second gate. No way to change that in the settings. Excellent. It did overshoot just a hair, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's why they gave us the closed plate, is so we can help keep the tooth gates aligned. All right, so like we discussed earlier, there's two things that this system does not come with, the dual gate operator for ghost controls. It does not come with a mount for the solar panel. You're gonna have to pick one of those up on your own. Any security website, any CCTV. Um, the one I used is from a Unity Wi-Fi extender. I had one laying around that I ordered uh, previously. So that's what I was able to, I spray painted it black and that's what we put up on the post. The other thing you need to include are two C batteries for your keypad. So when you go to program keypad, you gotta make sure that your wireless remotes are working. Once you verify that your wireless remotes are working, you can do the setup for the keypad. So make sure we follow the instructions. This is my first time. So if you guys could just bear with me. All right. Install the batteries, any C size battery. Recommendation is Energizer and Duracell per their manual. All right. You've got to have your transmitter with you for this portion. Program the keypad. The following steps one through five are required and can only be performed on new keypads after factory reset. Press and release the program button. Party. LED should be solid. So that's in the upper right hand corner. So we are going to press and release the program button. Nothing happened. Should have an LED light up. Is there an on off button? I guess I needed a second to start up. All right, the party button is lit now, so I would just give it a few seconds before you start trying to hit the button. Uh, party button in the upper right hand corner is lit, but it's not blinking. Enter a four digit primary pin. Now it's blinking after we put in the four digit pin. Re-enter the new four digit pin. The LED turned off and the one with the key LED came on. Place the transmitter as shown and press the transmitter button. LED turns off. LED for the V lock comes on. And now I can uh, program a four digit access pin for guests. It beeped and the LED turned off. So now we can test the primary. All right. Let's close it again so we can test.
gates are closed. We will test the primary pin first. Nothing happened. Oh, it's got a... Oh, you have to hit the send button. <laughs> Big green button at the bottom. You gotta press that after you type in your pin. It looks like we're good to go on this one. I'm assuming using this, I'm probably gonna wanna set up the auto close time as well. And we wanna make that an extended time so the people with the trailer can get out of the driveway since we didn't get sensors with the gate. Uh, that way it allows them time for traffic that's coming and going.